much would you pay for a carbon credit? Nothing. How much? Nothing. Nothing. Exactly. In a free market, it would be free. Zero. So this is the crazy world where everything we know about language is being destroyed. And of course, in a free market, well, of course, this is not a free market, normally we would expect one law to apply to everyone, wouldn't we? One law for all. The Gillard government is going to each individual power station to arrange rules that work and fit. There is no end to the possibilities when you put a tax on life about which sectors you'll apply it to, which ones you won't, how much it will work for each individual. Will we all pay the same rate? Absolutely not. Some people will be compensated and some won't. They say we'll give breaks to the trade exposed exporters, to the domestic exposed employers and to low income earners and to medium wage holders and to our friends, our fans and our marginal seats. <laughs> In fairyland greenomics, everyone gets jobs and no one gets to pay. It's crazy. Look, ladies and gentlemen, for 17 years, I thought we should be concerned about carbon dioxide. I kid you not, I was a member of the Australian Greens. It's the only political party I've ever been a member of. I helped raise funds for them in the 90s. I was a member of Greenpeace and the Wilderness Society. I too was a friend of the Rainbow Warrior. That's right, I paid money every month. Boy, was I naive. Yeah, yeah, well then I grew up. So, my point is though, what was the moment when suddenly the light went on on the CO2 issue for me? And that moment was um, when my husband, who you'll hear speak next, said to me one day in 2007 on a Tuesday afternoon, he said, Joanne, he said, there's no evidence for man-made global warming. And he worked for the greenhouse office. Well, I, of course, and naively said, are you kidding? Of course there's evidence. What about the Vostok ice cores? Now, the Vostok ice cores, which you saw thanks to Al Gore in An Inconvenient Truth, look at the correlation, CO2 and temperature. You can't look at that graph and not notice that when CO2 is high, temperature is high, and it goes on and on and on, and CO2 levels currently are much higher than they have ever been. You can't look at that and not say, oh my goodness. Of course we needed to look at this. Of course we needed to spend money and research it. But here's the thing that shocked me. He said, yes, but Joanne, you know that temperature rises first, don't you? <laughs> By 800 years. <laughs> and my face was... 800, 800 years? I had no idea. I read every scientific popular magazine on the topic for years. I thought I knew something about climate science. My job was to be a science communicator. I thought I knew this, and yet there was I flawed. He said, not only is it well known amongst climate scientists, but not amongst anyone else, that there is an 800 year lag where temperature rises first, but it's been proven in several, um, it, by several different people. It's been shown, it's not contested, it's in the highest ranking journals, little things like science and nature. And, uh, and so indeed I looked it up. Between 1999 and 2003, definitively, it was shown there's thousands of years lag, sorry, hundreds of years lag on the upside and thousands on the downside. And you can even see in that graph, there's a point in the graph where temperature, well, well, let's do the close-up because that's what I did next. I downloaded the data and luckily it is available and I graphed this graph so that I could see what was going on. And you can see the blue line is temperature and it rises first and the orange line is CO2 which follows up the blue line. Then look at the blue line falls for 15,000 years and the orange line stays flat. Carbon dioxide does nothing for virtually 15,000 years while temperature falls about 8 degrees. They're not that connected. These graphs don't prove, by the way, that carbon can't have an effect, and I knew that. But what I also knew was we are not getting told the whole story by the journalists. This was a very material fact to the debate. Al Gore used it as the only piece of empirical evidence in his movie. And what did he get for it? A Nobel Prize. That's what you get when you make a movie full of errors. So the global half-truths, I started to hunt for them. The things that are true, there is a correlation between temperature and CO2, but it's not a correlation that matters for this debate. That correlation you can see in the last graph was temperature forces CO2 up and temperature eventually drags it back down again. When the world is warm, the oceans release CO2. When the world cools, it draws it back. 
it's a well-known thing to do with chemistry. And they tell us that 2010 was the hottest year ever. How many people have heard that? Yeah, go on, everyone's heard that. This is a uh, temperature sensor, very accurate. NOAA puts them out, maximum minimum temperature sensors. NOAA has very strict sighting regulations on where they're put so that they are 30 metres away from any artificial sources of heat. It's a $4 billion agency. It took Anthony Watts and a team of about six or 700 volunteers to go and photograph most of those stations. This is government funded. Guess how many were meeting the strict standards of NOAA? 11%. That's it. That's what we spend the money on. Government funded science, 11% of the thermometers managed by NOAA were in the right spot. And, so here's some examples. There's the thermometer, that little tiny spot back there. It is, of course, 30 metres away from all artificial sources of concrete, heat, buildings, electronics and plant extracts. Can't you tell? And isn't it a lot like it would have been 100 years ago as well? Probably they would have had the old pre-Ford era kind of refrigeration units that didn't have electricity and whatnot. Look, here's another one. Someone thought it was a good idea to put this Stevenson screen above the concrete in a car park. <laughs> it's lucky hot air doesn't rise on concrete, isn't it? I mean, really, you don't need a PhD to understand why this is not rigorous science. I can't tell you how much this affects the temperature. I can only say that a real scientist would leap up and down when faced with this and say, oh my goodness, thanks for telling me about this. We must remove all these ones from our record and fix them and put them in the right spot. Instead, the response was, shh, don't tell anyone. We'll, we, we fixed it anyway. We've got computers. That's right. We statistically corrected for all of these. Why do they bother with the thermometers? Just use a computer. Here's Melbourne, little streets known as the Victoria Road and Latrobe Street. And the temperature sensors are there. I'll do a close-up for you. That's right. There's the two temperature sensors. They are on grass. There's nine lanes of traffic and a tram and about 50 to 100,000 cars a day. But this is 0.7 of a degree we're looking for over 100 years. 0.7 of a degree. And this is where the thermometers are commonly placed. This is one of my favourite ones. Anyone spot the problem? Someone's come along and put an air conditioning exhaust vent there and we know what comes out of those and it sure isn't cold air. Now, could they find bigger air conditioning ducts, do you think? Could they? Did they? They did. There's industrial air conditioning ducts, ladies and gentlemen. There's a thermometer. There it is. Could they find even bigger exhaust vents? Yes, they can and they do. <laughs> And you think I'm kidding, don't you? Watch. <laughs> That's right. There they are. There's a 737. <coughs> Insanity, ladies and gentlemen. This is not science. Now, notice this. In 1920, there were a lot of temperature sensors in the US. As the years roll on, there's temperature sensors all over the world, and then a funny thing happens in 1980. You'll see this again in a second. We'll run it through again. 1920, the US had most of the world's temperature sensors. That's all the pink dots. Then sometime in around about 1980, we got worried about global warming and where did those sensors go? All that money went into it and all those sensors disappeared from the official records. The sensors are still there, but we're not counting the official records of those sensors. There's a spot in the north of the Andes where we don't pay attention to the thermometers for our official records. Instead, they calculate the temperature at the top of the Andes using 1,200 kilometre smoothing from thermometers that are on the beaches in Peru and in the forests of the Amazon. Oh. We'd all do that, wouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> Who needs thermometers? 75% of the stations have disappeared. Arctic ice, hands up, who's heard? Arctic ice, sea ice I should say, is at record lows. Who's heard that? How many news headlines have we seen? And yet, when we look at, what, what's that other spot with sea ice? <coughs> the Antarctic. That's right, there's the other side of the world. What happened in the Antarctic? Actually, we hit record highs. How many headlines did we see saying Antarctic sea ice at record highs? Zero. Exactly. We're getting half the story. This is global sea ice. Remember, it's supposed to be global warming, isn't it? Not Arctic warming, it's global warming. Yes, there has been some changes in the Arctic and there has been a slight drop off in the last few years, but for the most part, the peaks of the graph, each year six million 